Howdy, welcome to another High Yield MCAT Science video. My name is John. I'm a now officially third year medical student. I just took step one two weeks ago. I'll let you know if I pass. If you don't hear from me, then that means I failed and I don't want to talk about it. Before I actually came to medical school, I had spent several years tutoring as a professional MCAT tutor and I've continued to do that on into medical school. I run this MCAT channel with my partner and actually my sister, Maggie, and we have the goal of making the MCAT in medical school as accessible to everyone as possible without you know, financial means being a significant barrier for entry. This series is one where Maggie and I walk through the high yield MCAT ebook or the, this, this guide that we wrote, which goes through and it breaks down all the high yield sciences that we think are on the MCAT and we teach you them in just kind of layman's terms, exactly what you need to know, not all the fluff that you learn in undergraduate and tell you how it's frequently tested on the MCAT and how to apply that. If you're interested in where to get that book, then the link will be in the description. Today's video, we're talking about one of the highest yield topics on the MCAT in general and definitely top two on the chemistry and physics section. Today, we're talking about enzyme kinetics. We're gonna cover um, what kinetics is, uh, michaelis minton kinetics, saturation, line weaver burke plots, and um, we're going to briefly touch on reversible inhibitors, although there is a good mnemonics video that I will point out a little bit later. So let's jump into it. So before we start talking about michaelis minton kinetics and enzyme kinetics in general, it's important that we discuss the distinction between kinetics and equilibrium, because there is a distinct distinction, and it is frequently tested on the MCAT. So let's go ahead and look at the whiteboard and talk about exactly what that distinction is. So here I've got typed out some really brief generic uh, definitions. Kinetics is kind of the speed of the reaction and equilibrium is the ratio of the products to the reactants that results in steady state. Now that's very buzzwordy so let's kind of let's kind of walk through it so that it makes a little bit more sense. Let's first start with what they have in common because students, myself included, frequently misconstrue these two and it's like why is that happening? It's because they're both describing reactions. So I want you to imagine uh, just a very classic reaction of H2O2 goes to water, right? So 2H2O, uh, how do we balance this? Put a 2 there, right? Yeah. So they're both talking about a reaction. The only difference is that the kinetics is talking about the speed of reaction. So how quickly we get from this side to this side, whereas the equilibrium is talking about our ratio of products to reactants in steady state. So the concentration of those. So I think that's why it frequently gets misconstrued. Um, but kinetics is usually talking about things like enzymes, speed, stuff like that, whereas equilibrium is talking about stuff like KEQ, um, concentrations, and all of these we'll discuss in a later video, um, and then Le Chatelier's principle, which is probably the biggie when it comes to equilibrium. And that's actually a video that should be coming out shortly, so make sure you're subscribed. Part that's tested on the MCAT is the fact that things that increase the kinetics, namely like enzymes, generally do not uh, have an impact on equilibrium. So adding an enzyme has no effect on the equilibrium of reaction. It just helps it get to that equilibrium faster. And changing the concentrations or changing things that mess with the Chatelier's principle, etc., have no impact on the kinetics or how fast that reaction reaches it. Now, there's a giant wall that separates these two, as I've illustrated so elegantly with the line. But you notice there's a sneaky window right here. Now, that sneaky window is meant to represent temperature because temperature can impact both the equilibrium and the kinetics of a reaction. So if you get an MCAT question and it says which of these can impact both the kinetics and the equilibrium or something to that tune, then note that temperature is the only thing that can do it because an increase in temperature can speed up the rate of reaction. It can denature the enzyme because enzymes are proteins. It can denature the enzyme and completely um, decrease the rate of reaction if it's too hot. 
but also temperature can increase or decrease the amount of products or reactants depending on the reaction, which would actually change the equilibrium. So those are the two things that are different about it. And today we will discuss almost exclusively kinetics, right? That's the point of this video. So equilibrium will be coming in a few weeks whenever we talk about the shotley yates principle. But today we're talking about kinetics. It's just important that you understand the difference between the two because this is frequently an enzyme, uh, this is frequently an MCAT question. They'll talk about the addition of an enzyme and ask its impacts. And one of the incorrect answer choices is that it changes concentration in some form or fashion. It's actually a sneaky, difficult question. So don't make that mistake. So now that we kind of know that we're talking about enzymes, let's actually talk about enzymes. Enzymes, I told you earlier, are proteins. In these proteins, um, we always draw them as Pac-Man, right? So I'm not going to break the mold. They are proteins that will take a substrate and convert it to a product. And so I'm going to draw that substrate as a triangle because that is true art. So this triangle that's representing the substrate, it's going to bind to the enzyme. And where it's going to bind is called the active site. And I'll just kind of kind of got that highlighted. And so it binds to the enzyme and creates something called the enzyme substrate complex, which is literally just them bound together. Okay, so I will draw that below in, what's third grade tell you? What does red and blue make? Is it purple? We'll see. So now they are together because they love each other. Because whenever an enzyme and a substrate love each other very much, then they go to sleep and the stork comes and drops off the product. So now we have the enzyme and the product. So you start with the enzyme separately and the substrate separately and then you move to the enzyme substrate complex and then you move to the enzyme and the product. Now you note that the substrate is not conserved. We don't have a triangle anymore, but the enzyme is conserved. So the enzyme does not get used up in a reaction, and that's an important component of what makes an enzyme an enzyme, um, whereas the substrate does get converted to a product. Now, this is classically described with this equation. The enzyme plus the substrate get converted into the enzyme substrate complex, which gets converted to the enzyme plus the product. But how do they actually speed up the reaction rate? Well, they do this by stabilizing something called the transition state. Now we know whenever we're talking in gen chem terms like we are now about stabilization, then that means actually lowering the energy because something with high energy is not very stable. You think of like somebody balancing a bunch of like spinning plates, like there's it's a really high energy, it's not very stable. But lower energy is stable. So the transition state which is what's getting stabilized, is defined as the maximum amount of energy in an energy reaction curve, which is actually what we had our illustrators draw out here. So this is a figure from that high yield guide that I was talking about earlier. And the transition state is whenever you're looking at the curve that says without an enzyme, it's there. And whenever you're looking at the curve that says with an enzyme, it's there. So. You notice between the two of these, one's a lot lower, right? That's because it's been stabilized or lowered. When you add the enzyme, it stabilizes or lowers the transition state. So if you get asked a question on the MCAT about where the enzyme is having its maximum impact, it's not the substrate, it's not even uh, the product, it's not the enzyme substrate complex, it is the transition state. That's where enzymes or catalysts have their impact. Now this chart is a really good chart for you to familiarize yourself with because it has some really important things. Not only do you get to see the transition state and how that plays a difference um, on, on the actual energy that's required to make a reaction carry out or go forth, but you get to see some topics that are frequently tested like activation energy, which is just how much energy you have to put into the reaction for it to do the rest of its work itself. And the way that I've always taught this is imagine a ball. Imagine that you have this giant ball and you're gonna roll it up this big hill. Well, once it gets to the hill, 
it's going to kind of roll down by itself, right? You don't have to push it down the hill. But you have to add a lot of energy to get that ball to the top of the hill. To get that ball to activate, you have to add energy. That's the activation energy. Now you notice that once we stabilize that transition state, our activation energy is a heck of a lot lower. So you stabilize the transition state, you lower the activation energy, which means how much energy you have to add to the reaction so that it will go forth and carry out on its own. You also see the overall energy released during reaction right here. And you note that it's just the difference in the energy of the reactants to the energy of the products. It is not the difference from the transition state to the products. It's the difference from the reactants to the products. So I think this is a good figure. Maybe not a bad one to commit to memory. You don't have to know that we're talking about what is this glucose and, and oxygen. You don't have to know about that. Okay, now we've, we've talked about kinetics and equilibrium, how they're distinct from each other, what an enzyme is and how it's doing its job. So let's finally talk about Michaelis-Minton kinetics. Michaelis-Minton kinetics is a term that's used to describe a whole lot of things, but its true application is as a saturation curve. And this curve is going to show the, the relationship between substrate comp, uh, concentration and the reaction velocity. So here on the bottom left, that is a Michaelis-Minton curve. So some assumptions about a Michaelis-Minton curve that I didn't quite understand for a while is that the amount of enzyme you're using is set. You don't change the enzyme with a Michaelis-Minton curve, you just change the substrate concentration. So it's like, what this is really describing is how fast does my set amount of enzyme convert substrate to product depending on how much substrate, like how much gas I'm giving it. So the equation that you need to familiarize yourself with which describes this is V is equal to Vmax times the substrate concentration divided by Km plus the concentration of substrate. Um, now yes, you have to do mental math here, but that's just kind of part of it, isn't it? So let's quickly define these terms, and I'm actually going to point them out on the Michaelis-Minton curve because that's what's really important is being able to recognize these on a curve and then later on in a line weaver burt plot. So V is the velocity. That is how fast you are currently converting substrate to product. And so that is going to be represented by the y-axis. You can see that that velocity changes as we change the substrate concentration. Vmax is the maximum speed that that enzyme could possibly convert substrate to, or substrate to product depending on the amount of um, substrate. If substrate were no issue, how fast could I possibly go is the question. And that's Vmax. You can see that it's a straight line because it's the maximum. It's as fast as it can possibly go. Um, substrate concentration is pretty self-explanatory. It's how much substrate you have, but it's on this x-axis. And then Km, this is kind of the difficult one. Km is another description of substrate concentration, but it is, it is the amount of substrate concentration at one half of the maximum velocity speed. So you'll, you'll frequently hear Km is equal to substrate concentration at one half Vmax. And that's true, but what it really is, is it's a proxy for affinity. So let's look at this graph so that we can understand it just a little bit better. You see that we have Vmax. If we were to half it, it would be about right here. So this is one half Vmax. And then if we draw a line, we draw a straight line to where it intercepts the curve, and we go straight down to a substrate concentration, that is Km. So what about where I intercept the curve here. Is that Vmax or is that Km? No, because that is higher than one half of Vmax. What about right here? No, that's lower than one half of Vmax. So you find Vmax, you go to half of it, and then you find where it intercepts the curve, you drop it down to the substrate concentration, and that substrate concentration is what Km is. So that's it for the michaelis minton saturation curve. Now the second thing that's important to know and pay attention to is the line weaver burke plot. Now, here it's important to note that we did draw a distinction between Km and affinity, so they are actually inversely correlated, so one over affinity. And what this means is that the higher Km, 
the lower the affinity, which kind of makes sense. If you need a whole bunch of substrate to reach one half Vmax, and that probably means that you don't bind it very tightly. You don't have a high affinity for it. You don't really like it that much. But if you have a low Km, meaning you don't need that much substrate to meet one half of Vmax, that means that like, yeah, you really, really like it. Like you are greedy with it. You want to, you want to take more of it. So that's kind of where that inverse relationship comes from. Another way to look at these metrics, which is what's commonly tested is the line weaver burke plots and these are usually tested in the context of reversible inhibitors which we'll get to in just a little bit but first you need to understand what the intercepts mean so this is something called a double reciprocal plot of this meaning it's the same data it's just shown in a different fashion and they do that just so they can make the curve linear the only takeaways that you need to note from this graph is that the x-intercept is negative 1 over km and the y-intercept is 1 over vmax and then the slope is km over vmax. The way that this is tested is you have to understand that mathematically as the y or the x-intercept move closer to zero that means this bottom number is getting bigger. So if your y-intercept is here, then that means Vmax is bigger than it is here. If your y-intercept is here, then that means that Vmax has shrunk. And that's because you know, 1 over 2 is equal to 0.5, which we'll say is here. But 1 over 4, if we double Vmax and it gets to 4, then that's 0.25. So that's closer to 0, which would be right there. So understand that conceptually. And it's, it works the exact same way for um, Km. I know some people get tripped up because it's a negative but you're still approaching zero. You know, negative one over two is equal to negative 0.5, but negative one over four is equal to negative 0.25. So you're still approaching zero. So as you increase Km or Vmax, you get closer to zero. So your line is gonna follow suit. That's something that is sometimes tested without numbers. They'll just say something like the affinity has increased um, which means that the Km would decrease and then they'll say if this is your original line we'll pick out your new line and your new line will have to be something like this right something that's going to intercept the x-intercept um, further away from zero because we just said that Km got smaller. The last piece of this puzzle is something called reversible inhibitors. Now what reversible inhibitors do is they bind to either the enzyme um, at the active site allosterically which just means away from the active site but they kind of like change the form of the enzyme so that it no longer recognizes or recognizes as well the substrate or they can bind the enzyme substrate complex um, in general and prevent it from separating so they can either bind um, here you know somewhere away from the active site to prevent these two from getting married and loving each other. They can actually bind the active site and physically block the substrate from coming in, or they can bind the enzyme substrate complex and just like hug them to death and be like, you're not leaving, you're here, I'm the captain now. So that is um, how reversible inhibitors work and where they're binding depends on which type of reversible inhibitor you're discussing, whether it be competitive, uncompetitive, or non-competitive. Now, I actually recommend screenshotting these if you don't have the book, um, because these are figures from the book. So screenshot these. These are something that you need to have memorized when you take the MCAT. Um, but I actually have a mnemonics video, which I'll link in the description, that goes over all these and teaches them in a fashion that I think is, is pretty digestible and will get you a couple free points on your exam. Again, the link to that book, as well as all the ways that you can support us, whether that be um, financially by, by, by purchasing, purchasing a book, or whether that just be, you know, you want to hang out with us more on, on Discord, study with us on Discord some, or maybe you want to follow us on social. Links to all of that are in the description. But the best way that you can support us for free is by liking the video, subscribing to the channel, and sharing this video or one of our others with either a friend or a pre-med advisor or club. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.